Hello, welcome to the Center for Connected Health Policies Telehealth and Medicaid Fall Series. Today's topic will be on Medicaid telehealth permanent policies. My name is Mei Kuang. I'm the Executive Director at the Center for Connected Health Policy. A few disclaimers and friendly reminders before we get started. Please note that any information provided in today's webinar is not to be considered legal advice. It is strictly for informational and educational purposes. CCHP always recommends that you consult with your organization's legal counsel if you are interested in formal legal opinion. Also know that neither CCHP or our speakers have any type of relevant financial interest arrangement or affiliation with any company or product that may happen to be shown or mentioned in today's webinar. Today's webinar will be recorded and the slides will be made available a couple of days after the webinar on CCHP's website. Additionally, closed captioning is made available for today's webinar. You will see that closed captioning button on your toolbar for Zoom. We also ask, ask that people refrain from making political statements or advertising commercial products or services during the webinar. Additionally, we ask that you reserve the chat only for technical difficulty or questions regarding Zoom. You please use the Q&A function if you have a question for our panelists. Bit of background about CCHP, we were established in 2009 as a program underneath the Public Health Institute to be a California telehealth policy organization, but an opportunity to become the federally designated National Telehealth Policy Research Center became available in 2012 through a grant from HRSA. CCHP applied for that, we received it, and we've been serving in that capacity ever since. We also work with a variety of other funders and partners on the state and federal level on more specific telehealth projects or connected health projects. We also act as the administrator for the National Consortium of Telehealth Research Centers, and we are a convener for a group in California called the California Telehealth Policy Coalition, which is a coalition of over 100 statewide and national groups who are interested in advancing telehealth policy in the state of California. The National Consortium of Telehealth Resource Centers is made up of the 14 telehealth resource centers who are underneath the same funding program as CCHP. There are 12 regional resource centers that cover specific states and two national centers, one on policy, which is CCHP, and one on technology that's based in Alaska. We all work collaboratively together in order to maximize the use of our resources and also to reduce any duplication of work or materials. CCHP's Medicaid telehealth policy series has um, been going on. This is its third version. It's the fall 2021 version. And we did this uh, through funding from HRSA for uh, through grant GA5RH37470. Um, this series is, as I said earlier, being recorded and is there for educational purposes. If you would like to know about future series that CCHP may be holding, we ask that you subscribe to CCHP's newsletter. Today's webinar, we'll be hearing from representatives from Oregon, North Carolina, and Arizona. We have Lori Coiner from the Oregon Health Authority, Dr. Sher Shannon Dowler from North Carolina Medicaid, and Dr. Sarah Salek from Arizona Healthcare Cost Containment System. So for those who have attended past CCHP webinars, they may look a little familiar to you. These are all speakers that we've um, had talking on various topics before, and they are all wonderful and extremely knowledgeable about their subject matter. We'll start off first with Lori Coiner. So Lori Coiner is the Senior Medicaid Policy Advisor who oversees Oregon's Medicaid program covering nearly 1 million Oregonians through a coordinated care system led by 15 coordinated care organizations. She returned to the role in February 2019 after a year consulting with Health Management Associates as the Managing Principal of the Portland office. During her 2015 to 2017 tenure as Oregon's Medicaid director, she played a pivotal role in securing federal renewal of Oregon's Medicaid 1115 waiver that includes innovative strategies to incent investment in social determinants of health, value-based payment methods, and continues Oregon's health system transformation that includes Oregon's quality instead of payment program. So I'll now turn it over to Lori. I think you're on mute, Lori. Sorry about that. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone, depending on which part of the country you're in. I my um 
Wi-Fi connection is really spotty today. And so I'm going to turn off my camera, but I thought I'd start with it on so you could see that I'm a real person. Um, and happy to be here to talk about uh, telehealth in Oregon Medicaid's program. Uh, next slide. So today I'm going to um, give an overview, just a couple slides about the Oregon Health Plan and the Oregon Health Authority, and then talk about the current state of telehealth in Oregon, um, some internal telehealth policy framework that's been developed really to focus on equity and um, supporting our goals in eliminating um, health inequities in Oregon through our telehealth policy framework. And then um, also give kind of a bigger landscape about where um, Oregon's Medicaid program has been going in supporting telehealth. Next slide. Just to give a overview, a little a little overview about Oregon's um, health plan. Um, so our Medicaid program in Oregon is called the Oregon Health Plan. We are covering now with um, the um, maintenance of effort requirements, we are covering about 1.3 million Oregonians. Um, we cover their physical, oral, and behavioral behavioral health care, about 40% are children. Um, our Oregon Health Plan includes Medicaid. It also includes CHIP. Um, we have a program called Cover All Kids, which covers um, undocumented children through a um, general fund from the state and um, Reproductive Health Equity Act folks who are um, enrolled for reproductive health. Next slide. The Oregon Health Authority has been working on its 10-year uh, strategic plan, and, and that strategic plan has resulted in a goal to eliminate health inequities in Oregon by 2030. And what that means is as we do our work in the Oregon Health Authority, which includes Medicaid and public health, um, behavioral health and other divisions, we uh, equity is front and center in terms of thinking about policy and um, how we move programs forward with the goal of eliminating health inequities. The Oregon Health Policy Board adopted this health equity definition. Um, and I'm going to read it because I think it's really important. Um, I don't typically read slides, but um, and th this is the health equity definition that we as an agency also are have adopted. So Oregon will have st established a health system that creates health equity when all people can reach their full health potential and well being and are not disadvantaged by their race, ethnicity, language, disability, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, social class, intersections among these communities or identities or other socially determined circumstances. Achieving health equity requires the ongoing collaboration of all regions and sectors of the state, including tribal governments, to address the equitable distribution or redistribution of resources and power, and recognizing, reconciling, and rectifying historical and contemporary injustices. And the reason this health equity definition is important I, I think for me to read is that um, as we've developed telehealth policy, we've really get the um, staff and different divisions that are involved in that work have have put this front and center in their thinking. And I'll, and I'll be highlighting that in the next slides. So next slide, please. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about where we are in telehealth in Oregon since the pandemic. So next slide. This shows um, the uptake in telehealth, you know, uh, during the pandemic and, and then, um, you know, immediately proceeding. So you'll see that in uh, 2020, the early months, January through March, there was very little um, telemedicine use. Uh, the pandemic hit and we had a sharp increase across the months of March, April, May. And um, I will say our Medicaid program jumped in right away to um, create temporary rules to facilitate the use of telehealth, um, you know, through our Medicaid program. And so we, uh, you know, and that's corresponded with these large upticks. And then it's remained high. Um, so 
you know, that I think that's an important piece for us is tele, telehealth is here to stay. We believe that it's an important component of the health system now. Um, and, and it's going to, you know, remain, remain high. And so developing policy around telehealth is, is important for that reason. Next slide. About 40% of the telehealth visits um, for Medicaid occur by audio only telephone. And I, this is really important because what, what we hear from members is that um, many people don't have access to good um, Wi-Fi signal like I don't right now <laughs> um, or broadband. Uh, people don't have data. Um, they only have phones. And I'm going to provide some statistics around this, but we've, we've learned that, you know, telephone, audio only Medicaid visits are really important for our population. Next slide. This um, map um, shows the distribution of broadband um, across our state and the blue and purple colors um, um, show where there's very high you know, uh, distribution of broadband, very good connection. Those areas also reflect where the population centers. So the, the you know, Portland metro area, Salem, um, also Bend in central Oregon. But you'll see um, to the right of the state, that's rural frontier. And we have very many areas that have no um, connection. Um, there's not a high population, but for people that live out there, um, you know, there's really no um, um, phone cell service unless you have a dial up or something at home. Next slide. And that that slide, you know, um, as I mentioned, really um, shows the rural um, rural urban divide that we experience. Um, and, and I think that's an important piece to highlight in our state and likely others. We also have a recent survey of Oregon WIC participants. And um, so here's some data that reflects the inequities in use of telehealth or ability to use um, um, full video telehealth types of visits. So 90% of those surveyed have a smartphone and use it daily. So if you look across all participants in WIC, which includes, um, you know, the full, full um, racial distribution, primarily white in Oregon, you, you would say, oh, well, 90% have a smartphone. But if we dig into the data a little deeper, what we see is that among those people who are Spanish speaking, 35% uh, use a flip phone daily. Um, respondents um, who said they used prepaid pay-as-you-go cell phone data is 23% total of that 90. So they, they have a smartphone, but they're, um, you know, pay-as-you-go for data. 44% um, of all respondents run out of data um, sometimes, and so that's a concern. And then also among respondents, 15% um, actually don't have a monthly internet service plan. So they're relying solely on their phone for um, accessing the internet. Next slide. So when we um, take a step back and, you know, take a look at telehealth in terms of where we have opportunities and risks, um, telehealth has the potential to exacerbate health inequities if we um, aren't cognizant of healthcare access, um, making sure that, that those telehealth visits are culturally and linguistically responsive, um, and that there's still an opportunity for people to ask request for you know, in-home care and community-based services. Um, and you know, we know that there are inequities in access to telehealth uh, due to broadband or devices or data literacy, as I, I just went through on, on data that we have. And um, we have heard from some members that they feel like they're being pushed towards telehealth medicine or telemedicine visits and, and that they feel like there's a decreased access to in-person visits. And, and we do 
think particularly for people who um, have cultural or linguistic, um, you know, specific needs that that option for in person in person care is really important. Next slide. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, kind of an overall policy framework that um, now that you have background about where we are in telehealth, um, about how this, you know, internally we we have come together to think about moving our telehealth policies forward. Next slide. So we developed a telehealth policy framework that's an internal resource guide. And, and I think that you may ask, why, why do you need that? <laughs> and um, let me give some examples of what happens, you know, who, who deals with telehealth within our agency. So, you know, we have the Medicaid program and our Medicaid program sets, um, you know, policy and rules around telehealth for our, our Medicaid program. We also have a, um, a community partners program and, and the community partners um, work with over a thousand different agencies around the state helping folks um, sign up for Medicaid and access care in Medicaid. And so they're dealing with members right on the ground. And what they might hear is important to members uh, around telehealth can be really different than what the Medicaid program might hear. So that would be an example of different parts of our agency that are working around telehealth policy and are, um, have a different lens. And so this policy framework is to kind of bring together the various lenses that we um, examine telehealth through and, um, and put it together to make sure that we're all um, kind of speaking from the same roadmap and that that focuses on equity and building um, a telehealth program that, that um, honors equity. Next slide. So as I mentioned, you know, it was really to improve our cross agency alignment, coordination and issue identification. Um, and as part of this, we have a, a, a cross agency team that comes together um, and meets regularly to talk about telehealth policy issues um, so that they can coordinate with staff doing this work. Um, there's a real common um, communication around our high level goals that goes out to partners like providers and members and that we it's an opportunity to identify issues um, where there's a need of resources or attention. Um, and then, you know, most importantly, I think this orange box on the left is a lot align all of our work under our shared vision to eliminate health inequities. Next slide. And this just gives an example of, you know, the kinds of things that we think about in terms of inputs. Um, you know, there's laws and regulations around telemedicine, there's workforce programs, um, we have various committees and boards that we report to. And so we have lots of different pieces that we need to manage. Um, you know, we've, we've done some surveys like that WIC survey, talk to our members to really understand where telehealth is working and where it's not. And then we're really looking at outcomes um, and that those outcomes are to improve equity, improve access to telehealth and, and good health care, ensure that there's a standard of care through telehealth um, and maximize patient choice um, and maximize coordination and alignment. And you'll see some of these principles this this is a, um, these are multi-state compact principles in terms of the outcomes um, we've been working with California Colorado Nevada and Washington on a um, you know kind of aligning what our, we want to see as good um, telehealth policy outcomes next slide uh, this is a framework excerpt um, and it shows seven questions that are in that framework that um, when you're thinking about new policy that um, we encourage staff to ask or a program to ask and that would be how will the proposed change to telehealth policy or a program uh, focus on issues faced by community in particular communities of color or tribal communities um, we, we also ask you know how does this protect privacy of a visit or and personal information? And you know, how do we ensure that there's an appropriate 
effectiveness of using telehealth or a particular modality. So I'm not going to walk through all of these because we'll make the slides available and I want to be cognizant of time, but these are, a, you know, a list of questions that um, are really where we encourage all folks who are working on telehealth policy to, to ask themselves as they're working through a policy development or rule or something like that. Next slide. I'm going to finish off my um, last few minutes here just talking about where we are in our Medicaid um, landscape around telehealth. Uh, next slide. So as I mentioned very at the very beginning of this, our Medicaid team jumped right away on um, establishing temporary rules for use of tele, um, telehealth um, at the onset of the pandemic. And um, then it became clear that, you know, tell, as I mentioned, telehealth is here to stay. And so um, those Medicaid policies have been turned in some cases into permanent rule um, and, and, you know, permanent policies that we see are, are going to be happening moving forward. Um, so I'll, I'll outline these real really quickly. One is that um, we no longer have restrictions on distant or or originating sites. And what that means is that members can have a telehealth visit from their own home. Uh, providers have more um, flexibility in where they are delivering that telehealth. Um, the next is um, that telehealth is allowed for new patients as well as established patients. Uh, we have a pay parity across Medicaid for telehealth and in-person visits. So what, if, if a member has a uh, telehealth visit, then Medicaid pays the same uh, rate for that visit as if it were in person. And interpreters in a telehealth visit must be paid at parity as well. Um, we do require um, an audio only modifier in our when someone is billing for a telehealth um, visit and that should be it. Audio only should be in use only if there is no um, AV available or feasible for that patient. And that's partly, um, you know, we really don't want to have um, telephone visits become the norm unless unless that's something that the patient wants and um, and needs. Um, patient consent for a telehealth visit is required, and uh, providers must ensure meaningful access to telehealth uh, visits if a patient requests it. Next slide. Well, uh, the Oregon, legislate, um, Oregon legislators passed um, some of the COVID expansion policies around telehealth as permanent um, law. And so I uh, wanted to highlight these. This just happened, our session ended in July, beginning of July. And so House Bill 2508 expands coverage and um, establishes pay parity for telemedicine services in Oregon. So the Medicaid program started with pay parity and this bill requires um, commercial plans to also pay at parity. Um, and audio only visits are included in that. House Bill 2591 um, funds three telehealth pilot projects for school-based health centers. And um, school-based health centers are a distant site that provides telehealth in conjunction with a school nurse that can be located at a different site. So it allows for that, like I mentioned at the beginning, some you know, site variation um, so that it's easier for school nurses to have a telehealth visit with a, a student. Next slide. We have a couple of Medicaid rule changes for 2022 that focus on patient choice. And we, um, I, I mentioned this a little earlier, but we wanna make sure that um, patients don't feel, and mem Medicaid members don't feel like they're being coerced into having telehealth visits. If they want an in-person visit, they can have one, but also that if they uh, need to have a telephone only visit, that option is available as well. So this concludes my uh, presentation, and um, thank, you, thank you, everyone, and I'm going to turn it back over to May. Thank you, Lori, and we have quite a few questions. I will remind folks again to please use the Q&A function if you have a question for our panelists. 
the chat should only be used if you are having technical difficulties with Zoom or some other technical difficulty. So Lori, I actually wanna just ask a clarifying question. So Oregon Medicaid's approach to audio only wasn't necessarily to select services where audio only could be used, but basically it was looking at it from if the patient is encountering some type of issue where they can't either see a provider in person or via live video, that's when you can use audio only. Right, audio only is a very patient-centered choice as opposed to saying, you know, for these particular office type visits, you can have a audio only. Okay, great. So we're going to take a couple of questions for Lori, but I will remind folks, um, again, please put your question into the Q&A function. And Lori will be back after all of our speakers have gone. We'll bring all of our speakers back for a full panel Q&A session. But the first question we have for you, Lori, is from Dana Northcraft. Northcraft, also about audio only. She was asking, did you face any pushback on audio only? What messages work best in making that part of the telehealth package? That's a good question. Yes, there's been lots of discussion about audio only, about whether it's appropriate, whether providers um, start using it in lieu of an inpatient visit when really they need to see the person. Um, and so I, I think the way that we handled that pushback was making it a patient-centered choice as opposed to a provider-centric choice. Um, our next question is from Larry Gentry. Are there any updates or expected changes to allow providers to give telehealth services to patients that are out of state? This stopped and impacted a lot of patients when emergency orders ended. You know, I'm, that is a really good question, and I'm not sure. I'd have to check with our staff uh, around that. I believe we still can do out-of-state um, telehealth visits because, you know, we've, we've put lots of the um, um, rules that were established under the uh, pandemic as permanent, but um, I, I don't know for sure, so I don't, I don't want to answer. I, I can get back to you on that. Okay. And, and if Lori, if you want to just send that to like CCHP, we can also make sure that gets to like Larry to then answer. Great. Okay. okay. And we have a question from Molly Coy. How are you addressing the question of language capability of telehealth solutions for meeting needs of the population? That's a really good question. Also, um, language has been a big issue. We know that um, it, it's it's we hear from members that it's much harder to have a visit when there's an interpreter on the a third line, but we are we do have uh, pretty rigorous standards for our um, community care organizations, our CCO coordinated care organizations, our CCOs around um, that they must provide and pay for interpreter services, and that does include telehealth. Um, and our fee for service program also um, pays for um, interpreter services and is required. So, um, you know, it it it's tough. I, and we know that some non-English speaking uh, people much prefer to be in person because of that. We'll take one more question uh, before we move on to our next speaker. It's from Maria Bowler. I'm gonna apologize right now, just like an apology if I'm pronouncing anybody's name wrong. Um, what is your audio only modifier? Oh, I have to get to that specific modifier, but we do, um, like I mentioned, um, I don't know what the code is, but there is a modifier so that it, um, shows that the patient, you know, needed to have an audio visit. And this, um, we, we did this in, to get back to the first question because there was pushback on audio only and we want to be able to track, you know, what proportion are audio only and make sure that the provider, um, you know, is, is doing it because it's the, at the patient's request. Okay, great. Uh, ooh. Excuse me one moment, had a slight issue here. Um, as I said, we will get back to uh, Lori's, uh, Lori later in our webinar. Hold on one moment as I adjust something here with my screen, just had a slight issue with PowerPoint there. Um, but we will move on to our next speaker. Thank you, Lori. We will um, look forward to hearing more from you when we get to our full panelist Q&A. But right now we are going to move over to Dr. Shannon Dowler. And Dr. Dowler joined North Carolina DHHS as the Chief Medical Officer for North Carolina Medicaid in 2019. Her past experience with Medicaid includes chairing the Physician Advisory Group for Medicaid, an independent legislative nonprofit whose sole purpose is advising Medicaid on clinical policy for many years. 
In the COVID pandemic, she has led efforts across DHHS related to telehealth and health equity with focus on increasing testing in historically marginalized populations. Dr. Dowler received her medical degree from East Carolina School of Medicine and completed a family medicine residency and fellowship in Asheville at MAHEC. She has spent her career in the service of nonprofits, including the local health department providing full spectrum care, as well as longstanding role in the STD clinic as CMO for a large FQHC in Western North Carolina, and most recently served as Associate Chief Quality Officer and Chief of Community Medicine for Mission Health System, focused on integration of healthcare and reducing unnecessary care variation across the health system. She is past president of the North Carolina Academy of Family Physicians and has served on national commissions with the AAFP and ACOG. In 2017, she received her certified physician executive degree from the American Academy of Physician Leaders. She is an avid educator and advocate for sexual health. Dr. Dowler speaks at the local state and national level on STD prevention, diagnosis, and treatment to both professional and lay audiences. She is known by the moniker Rap Dr. D, as she has produced two educational rap videos for lay audiences, which are very good, by the way. The second, STDs Never Get Old, achieving brief international attention. In 2021, she will be publishing a lay audience book on STDs in the aging population, and I give you Dr. Dowler. Thanks. We got to work on that bio. That is way too long. My admin assistant must not have sent you the truncated version. Um, thanks so much. It's great to be here with everybody today to talk a little bit about what's going on in North Carolina and North Carolina Medicaid. I've spoken around our telehealth approach um, a couple of times in the, a few different venues that are national. So I hope that some of our learnings in North Carolina can help you in your part of the country where you find yourself. Um, we'll go on to the next slide. Um, so object permanence for uh, those of you that aren't in the child developmental space is our understanding that objects can continue to exist even when we cannot see them, hear them, or otherwise sense them. This is a key tenet in child development. But it also, as it turns out, is really important to payers because once we turn something on, uh, we keep paying for it and it keeps happening no matter what. So once you've let the genie out of the bottle, it's very hard to put it back in. And so we did that really rapidly with the pandemic. And so um, I wanted to take you through a little bit of our deliberations around kind of what we've learned, where we struggled, what we've done that's unique and sort of what's coming next for us as we think about what's permanent in telehealth. So you can go on to the next slide. So early on, um, as we were moving very rapidly, we were turning out 12, 24, 36 new policies every week. And this happened week after week after week for six to eight weeks early on um, in the pandemic as we were rapidly responding and trying to make sure our beneficiaries were safe, um, that they were able to get care and access care remotely, and that our providers and their teams were safe. We didn't have enough PPE um, in many parts of our state. We had staff that were out sick. And so the staffing um, in clinics was poor. And then we also had people out on that felt great and they were on a 14 day quarantine. And so we couldn't um, afford to have them lose their access to patients for that whole time. And so we moved very quickly um, in North Carolina. And this is an early visual of as I was thinking through, okay, we're gonna turn on all these things. Um, and this is a lot of work, like 80 hour work weeks for everybody. What do we do with the next pandemic? So how do we create a switch so we can flip this on and off in the future? And so we created a whole process. We ended up calling it the circuit breaker because we, it really isn't a switch um, that simplifies it too much. There are just different times when you're gonna turn different things on and off based on what's happening in your environment. Are you having a natural disaster? Or are you doing uh, having another pandemic? So. If you go on to the next slide, over the course of the pandemic, um, we operationalized, we're almost at 400 flexibilities across multiple functional areas of our organization um, in, of Medicaid trying to respond to the pandemic in so many different ways and you know, relative to finance and clinical policy um, in the behavioral health space, pharmacy, you name it, we made some um, changes. And so we've tracked those and are really looking at what percent of things are we keeping on and are they the right things? And I'm gonna take you through some of our dashboards so you can see how we're measuring it in North Carolina and, and what we're paying attention to. If you go on to the next slide, 
So um, what did we learn? Number one, our early prediction models for the cost of telehealth grossly overestimated estimated the fiscal impact. So prior to having to do everything at once, there was a tremendous amount of fear that this wouldn't be a replacement service, that it would be an additive service. So we should double the cost or double our spend on all sorts of things because of telehealth. And what we found, in fact, is that is not the case at all. We looked at our beneficiaries and whether they had a follow-up visit um, more, were they more likely to have a second visit after a teleservice, meaning that it would be duplicative or after an in-person visit, and actually they were more likely to do an in-person visit. And so um, what we looked at early on, we were very conservative in our fiscal impact analysis, and what we've seen in the pandemic has not borne that out. Now, granted, a lot of people weren't seeking care for part of that time, so we're going to have to study this for a longer period of time to really understand it. Uh, the next thing I'll talk about is we've been measuring total cost of care all along. And uh, I'm a, I'm as, a, as opposed to Oregon, who seems very enthusiastic about telephonic, I have some real reservations in that space, um, but I've come along, I'm doing better. Um, but we, we have been looking at things when we're studying it in person versus telehealth versus telephonic because we're trying to understand the impacts. Um, we chose in North Carolina to reimburse at 80% of parity for telephonic. Um, and I'll go into a little bit more about that later. Um, and so when you look at the total cost of care, it's altered by both of those numbers. It's a little lower than telehealth. It's about that percentage difference in the reimbursement. Um, so we're gonna be digging into that data more to make sure we're really understanding it. Um, but it, bottom line is it doesn't look like there's a significant difference um, when you look at the non-ABD population, certainly you don't see any increase in total cost of care with telehealth and telephonic. Um, and then when you look at the ABD population, why that bump in telehealth? I've got my theories and I think it's related to COVID infections and frequent follow-ups and monitoring, but we're doing that analysis now to really understand that number. Uh, if you go on to the next slide, uh, the next thing we learned is that our early adapters, so our offices um, that went to telehealth faster, had much better outreach and outcomes. And so North Carolina was a state that was very, um, I will say early on the, the train with telehealth, Medicaid wasn't covering it at all essentially, only in one consultative way. So many of our providers hadn't invested heavily um, in telehealth services, but some just dove right in. And we saw that access to care and the percent of a panel that was seen um, actually was directly related. We saw that early on, and now you're looking at cumulative data, well over a year's worth of data, um, and there's still this persistence. People that were medium to high adopters of telehealth, meaning they build a fair number of telehealth visits, really did access a larger percentage of their patient panel um, and population and got new patients in the process. They were actually able to serve more people. Um, if you go on to the next slide. Um, not all our decisions were popular. No further explanation required. Um, we definitely every every week we we give a, we do an update a webinar and we tell everybody what we had done the week before, what we were turning on that week, and what we saw coming down the pipe for the next week. And um, every time we thought we had a pathway to the end where we had everything done. And by the end of that webinar, we had emails from different provider types saying, wait, what about us? What about us? So we ended up turning on telehealth for all sorts of provider types that had never been on our radar. Um, and that's not a bad thing, um, but uh, some of those weren't made permanent. And so that, that has created some uh, stress for some of our provider types. If you go on to the next slide, unexpected benefits continue to be revealed. Um, I think this is really true. And I think we're just so early on in understanding the impact of being able to access patients in a different way and provide services for them in a way that's more patient-centered. Um, is really something that we're continuing to learn. And in our, our uh, patient satisfaction survey that we just got the results like two days ago, we actually embedded some telehealth questions in it this year. And so we're gonna have some data soon to look at what people's experience was and what they thought about telehealth. And so we're excited to get that data. All right, if you wanna go on to the next slide. Uh, one of the other things that we really looked at and thought about was, is there a difference between in-person versus telehealth versus telephonic when it comes to uh, worsening status? So their chance of being a bounce back, you know, you get sick, you get seen by your doc, and then you get better and go home or you bounce back and you end up in the hospital. Um, and so that's a, a sort of ambulatory marker we might use. And what we saw was for our um, non-ABD population, 
and our ABD population, we saw an increase in that bounce backs or escalation hospitalization a little higher on the telephonic side um, than telehealth in both populations. But in the ABD population, actually in person had the highest rate of going to the hospital. So again, there's a lot to unpack in that data. What percentage of those were COVID positive and we split out you know, we'll need to do some analysis where we take our non-COVID patients and compare them to the COVID patients. Next slide. Um, we have dashboards that we've been tracking since the beginning of all this, trying to understand what's happening with our claims. And so another one of the unexpected um, happy things we've seen is behavioral health. A lot of our behavioral health codes really were utilized well, both with telehealth and telephonic. And you can look at um, these trends and see that the the darker purple line is the telephonic versus telehealth. And so the longer, more intense services were still being done by telehealth, but the shorter services, um, you saw a little telephonic. So, you know, where is that place where we can find a balance of what is the right thing for the, for the beneficiary and what gets them the best care? Next slide. Um, so to achieve the quadruple aim, we've got to be nimble. Um, and I don't know that people say that about Medicaid programs very often, but uh, we man, we learned how to be nimble in a pandemic. So um, in other words, there's more than one ways to skin a cat. That's why there's a cat picture there. If you go into the next slide, um, you'll see we studied uh, about mid-pandemic. We thought we we're thinking about our behavioral health patients that really had complex needs and those that are on antipsychotics. And we also looked at those being treated for opioid use disorder. And we saw that having access to telehealth really did improve their adherence to their medication regimen and their fills were happening on a regular basis. Um, so really positive things in certain pockets of the population. So if you're looking at what your needs are for a particular program or a state or a region, you might be able to modify some of your policies to, to strategically go after certain issues. All right, next slide. Um, so where do we struggle? Um, I'm going to talk through three areas where we had the, the most conversation. One is around telephonic only services. The next is around specialized therapies and then well child um, virtual visits for, for wellness, essentially. All right. So if you go on to the next slide. So telephonic only. Um, absolutely, there are positives to being able to use the phone. Um, when all else fails, it may be the only way you have to reach a patient. It's certainly more convenient for the provider and the patient. It's very easy to pick up a phone and make the call. It is the easiest kind of access uh, to service. Um, more people have phones in minutes than don't. You know, so we have cellular deserts. I actually live in one. I have better Wi-Fi than cell service where I live, but um, but the they're not as big as our broadband deserts. So we have a bigger issue there. Um, for low income and low health literacy, telephonic care might be more accessible and it may, it may really be the better option for them. Uh, the negatives are there as well. So the cost to provide the service by a practice is much lower. And if you look at our reimbursement rates, a lot of it is based on the cost of a practice to provide the service. And it's certainly lower than telehealth and much lower than in-person. Um, I would argue that the value of the care provided is lower. As a physician, um, being able to see my patient, do an assessment, look at their affect, um, you can do physical exams with telehealth in many ways that you just don't get that same thing on the phone. I think the risk of inappropriate clinical care is higher. So we're more likely to miss things um, when we just have a phone. I, the risk of fraud and abuse is definitely higher. Uh, you don't have any sort of visual way to confirm that your patient is who you think they are. Um, in that same area, HIPAA non-compliance is higher there. You might run into um, sharing information with a patient who you think you're talking to, but it's really not who they are. Um, and you can't necessarily recognize them based on the ID you see or their picture in the EMR on a telehealth visit. Now, when you're a family doc and you've taken care of somebody for a lot of years, you know their voice. So it's not true in every circumstance. Um, I think the bigger thing, and maybe the biggest thing for me on the telephonic only that I really worry about is that actually, I think we have the potential to exacerbate health inequities. And so I'm concerned um, that this will create an easy button. So we won't improve on the technology gaps and our digital divide we have in this country because we've got an easy button and we'll just say, we'll do it by phone call. The other piece is I think if we have the potential to actually prioritize lower value care to our historically marginalized populations um, because it is easier and that's not necessarily the best way to do it. So I have some strong opinions. We did decide to cover it um, temporarily and we did decide to make it permanent. The legislature didn't tell us to do that. We said we wanted to do it. We have not set our rate yet. It will not be full parity. It's going to be some rate. We're hoping uh, CMS comes out 
with some really clear guidance. The current reimbursement for telephonic care is, we think, too low. So there's some happy place in between. All right, if you go to the next slide, you'll see some of the ways we've studied this and where we've looked for, um, we've, we've looked for where we see aberrations to say, huh, is this being done the right way? This is an example where there were a bunch of audiology codes being billed telephonically. Um, and when we dug into it, it was only happening in two practices in the state. So I send that over to my compliance and audit team to say, hey, look into this, this doesn't feel right. Um, we looked at tobacco cessation. So we turned on the ability to do tobacco cessation telephonically. And what you see there is a pattern you would expect. You see that it goes up over time in the pandemic when the pandemic says it's worse. And then you see it start dropping down as things simmer back, simmer down and people get back into the office. So what I would say a pattern that I would expect to see. If you go on to the next slide, um, one of the areas that I'm particularly concerned about in telephonic is we're seeing these big bumps in some of our intensive behavioral health services, like um, intensive alcohol treatment and peer supports and other things where the vast majority of the care is now happening telephonically, not with telehealth and not in person. Um, so that's concerning to me as well. So we're watching some of these areas to decide what we really are going to allow permanently. If you go to the next slide. Um, specialized therapies was an area that I was totally prepared to say all of these are temporary. None of this is staying on us permanently. It just doesn't make sense for these things to happen. Um, but we learned, we did a lot of outreach and listening. You can see this long list. I don't have time to go into it all of all the positives that we heard from therapists and beneficiaries around the benefits of actually being able to provide specialized therapies. Um, but there are some negatives too. And we needed to weigh those out. Um, we saw telephonic being used more than we would have expected or liked in specialized therapy space, um, where it didn't feel quite right. Um, not, it was, we've heard particularly with certain children and certain ages, it's not as appropriate as with others. And a lot of those specialized therapies do require hands-on. So we really balanced between the positives we saw and the negatives and ultimately ended up leaving a lot in permanent policy, particularly in the speech therapy space. I think that was really the area where we, we found some real positives that we hadn't seen before. If you go to the next slide, you can see a, a look at one of our dashboards where I was looking at PT and OT um, and telehealth versus telephonic claims. And you saw there was just, you know, sort of an unusual amount of telephonic claims, but then that decreased over time. So my suspicion is as people got more comfortable with telehealth, got their platforms up and running, they then went to the um, real-time audiovisual instead of telephonic. Um, but just an area, even in May of this year, people were still billing those claims some, um, which is just something we're following. If you go to the next slide. Um, well child visits um, or wellness visits in general, um, a lot of the same positives and negatives in the other spaces. The big ones are, um, there's some real positives to a family, um, particularly when they have someone that's physically difficult to move um, between places or when you have really strong immune suppression. Challenges are many of these wellness visits really do need hands-on. You really gotta you know, touch somebody and examine them or track vital signs um, for growth that are really important that you're using kind of the same technology for that. Um, so one of the things we saw was that the field wasn't particularly excited about that and didn't really lean into it. If you go to the next slide, you can see that our um, well child visits um, were pretty low throughout the pandemic. There were some and in, in the larger populous areas it happened a little bit more, but it wasn't uh, one of these places where we saw thousands and thousands of claims every month. So I think our, our providers didn't love this one as much either. If you go to the next slide, um, some of the unique accomplishments, um, we spent a lot of time working on health inequities over the last year working on our prior authorizations and other things, not in the telehealth space, but looking at um, how our policies might inadvertently contribute to health inequities. But we also studied a lot around access to telehealth. And our most recent data, which I just this morning got, so it's not in my deck, actually showed that our Latinx population um, access telehealth at a higher rate than our non-Latinx population. So that was really interesting to see over time how that has changed. Um, the odds ratios we looked at, there was actually not a significant difference between different races. Um, we saw Latinx using it more. We saw those with chronic disease uh, more likely to use telehealth. Um, and we saw age, the older age groups use it more and more as time went on. Um, we did do some telehealth around early prenatal care and risk screens that we think has was um, helpful. This virtual lactation consultation idea, um, which, which we were like, why weren't we doing that all along? 
a new mom really doesn't need to be um, putting a newborn baby that's three or four days old in a car and driving them somewhere so someone can watch how they breastfeed. They could actually do that with a telehealth visit. Uh, another one is in respiratory therapy space around ventilator management. And that there is, especially in rural areas, if someone's on a ventilator at home and they're just having their settings looked at and reviewed, most of that can be done with technology. Um, but with a telehealth visit, you could actually do that. And so we saw some places where we we're like, huh, why didn't we think of that sooner? Probably the one that was my favorite was our hybrid home telehealth visit, where you send a trusted staff member out into the home. Instead of the physician leaving the office, they coordinate the telehealth visit with the physician and then can help with vital signs, labs, giving injections, immunizations, measuring fetal heart tones, doing the different things um, that you might do in an in-office visit. And you still get that higher reimbursement rate to send the staff member out instead of the doc. If you go on to that next slide, we did, so this was the part that really made me sad. I love this hybrid visit idea. A lot of people love the hybrid visit idea, but um, not many people ended up using it. So I think the, the complexity of trying to set up a program for that when everybody was so overwhelmed hasn't been big, um, but we've left it on and we wanna see if people will use it because I think this could be a real game changer for some of our patients. All right, if you go on to the next slide, um, this is a list of the clinical policies where we put on uh, permanent changes in telehealth space. So you'll see a really broad range. We looked across our programs to think about where there's a place for telephonic or telehealth care um, in different areas of Medicaid. And if you go on to the next slide, I think that's just my contact information. Um, yeah, happy to, to share more about our experience or um, answer questions as you think about what works for you. Thank you, Dr. Dower. As always, terrific presentation. Um, just really quickly, I have a question for you, um, myself. You said that for audio only at the, during the pandemic, you were, med not you, but North Carolina Medicaid was reimbursing at 80% uh, for audio only. How did you arrive at that 80% number? Um, well, it was, I would have gone with 50%. <laughs> I think, you know, the, the, the rate that we had at first, which we used the CMS rate, which was very low, it was probably 20% of parity. I mean, it was a really low number. And we, we recognized that that wasn't right either. But a lot of places hadn't done telehealth. We hadn't had it available to them. So they had to learn how to do it. They had to get the platforms. They had to teach their patients how to do it. Like this was a, a learning curve for everybody. The first time I did a telehealth visit, it took me a minute to figure it out. It certainly took my mom a few tries. So um, so, so we wanted there to be some grace in allowing, but what we saw was as soon as we announced that we were doing 80% of parity, the number of telephonic visits dropped off and the number of telehealth visits went up. So I think some of those practices that are like, yeah, I'm just going to use the phone. I'm not, I'm, it's the same reimbursement. I'm not going to do this work. When we said, yeah, you're going to get paid less. They actually ended up then shifting and doing the work to use the full real-time audio visual. Okay. Um, we have a question for you from Kristen Neville. Can you expand upon more on the challenges slash negatives you mentioned on your slide regarding specialized therapies? Um, yeah, so so we we can go back to that slide if we, I don't, I'm not sure how our time is. I, I don't wanna- We can go back to it. So let me go ahead okay. and share it. Yeah, so one of the things that was really positive was particularly in the child space, we um, heard a lot of our therapists talk about how parents were really engaged and active in therapy in a different way that when they were in the office, sometimes the parent would kind of be sitting in the corner on their cell phone or taking work calls, letting the therapist work with the child. But when they had to facilitate a visit with a telehealth component, they were actually engaged in the therapy and they saw that the number of visits actually ultimately went down, that the kids were able to reach their goals faster. Another piece was around um, seeing the space, the home environment, and this came in with some of the, the physical and occupational therapy where they could actually see the patient could take them around and show them their trailer and what the hallway looked like or their access to the house. And so it could help them sort of craft how they were going to support them really uniquely in a way that they didn't get when the person came into the office. Um, lack of follow-up was also a positive people could get more follow, quick follow-up visits. So they actually made progress through the services faster um, because I guess they had more accessibility because you didn't have to deal with scheduling issues as much. So that's just some of the positives um, that we saw. One of the other ones I thought was interesting was a lot of the teletherapy services apparently 
offer a lot of their software packages, offer a lot of patient education and support materials electronically that the therapist wouldn't necessarily have access to when they were doing an in-person visit because they might be at a remote site um, where they just had a file drawer with a few things. And with this, they could get more out to other people. So there's just there were just a variety of ways that I thought it was interesting. Um, some of the negatives where we saw the telephonic happening more than we would have liked, um, the children's ability to use some of the modalities. And then the biggest one was safety concerns. You know, is is it, does that caregiver that's helping someone adjust their wheelchair, are they really in a good place to catch that person if they fall or you know, there were there were some in the physical space we were more concerned about. Okay, we'll take one more question before we go on to our next speaker. Um, this is from somebody who wishes to remain anonymous. How was your community health worker utilization during the height of the initial wave of COVID-19? Were they physically dispatched to patients' residences? Um, so community health workers in North Carolina had not been a very, I would say, heavily funded or utilized service until the pandemic. And we got a lot of money through the Office of Rural Health, put money out there and did a lot of training with community health workers and utilized a lot of community health workers. I, I can't say what happened on the ground with them because I wasn't part of my lens, um, but I am a huge proponent of them. And so in some of our permanent policy changes, for instance, we're getting ready to turn on a, uh, this is not telehealth, but we're turning on a COVID outreach where we want to pay practices that have community health workers to help do outreach with vaccines and other things um, where we haven't paid them before. So we want to keep a funding stream available for community health workers. Okay, great. Dr. Dallar will be back with us when we go to full panel Q&A, but we are going to go over to our next speaker, who is Dr. Sarah Salik. She has been the chief medical officer for the Arizona Healthcare Cost Containment System since June of 2014. In her current role, Dr. Salik oversees all clinical operations for AHCCCS, including quality management, medical management, dental and pharmacy services, Specific initiatives aimed at improvement of service delivery and overall health of Arizonians includes active offers to tackle opioid epidemic, overseeing suicide prevention efforts, improving services to children with autism spectrum disorder, and improving service delivery to children and families involved with the Department of Child Safety. Dr. Salad grew up in Tucson, Arizona and graduated from the University of Arizona College of Medicine. She completed the Child and Adolescent Psychiatric Residence Training Program at Boston Children's Hospital through Harvard Medical School. And I'll now turn it over to Dr. Salad. Great, thanks so much, May, appreciate it. And good afternoon almost to everyone, hopefully. Um, and so we uh, can move on to the next slide. Um, wanted to just provide a um, high level glance uh, for those that are not familiar with Arizona's Medicaid program. Um, we're now right around 2.2 million Arizonans covered. So almost a third of Arizona is covered through Medicaid. And we cover over half the births in Arizona through Arizona Medicaid, as well as two thirds of the nursing facility stays. Um, we have a really rich uh, provider network with over 100,000 healthcare providers registered with um, our program. And our program since the inception in Arizona has been operated through an 1115 waiver and we are uh, mandatory managed care. So the vast majority of our members, of our 2.2 members are served through managed care. Next slide. All right, so um, when it comes to telehealth uh, policies for um, permanency and, and what we're gonna be doing in Arizona um, after the pandemic, I always like to um, provide the perspective of what we did prior to the pandemic. In fact, I think uh, May, um, you had uh, come and uh, presented here in Arizona and we were at the same conference um, through the University of Arizona and we had just uh, talked about implementing these changes at that conference. And so this was prior to pandemic, back on October 1st of 2019, we did a pretty um, large uh, overhaul uh, of our telehealth policy around expansion uh, based on um, a variety of issues, including um, what my um, co-presenters mentioned as far as Shannon and Lori uh, related to uh, access to care 
um, in particular for our rural communities. And so we uh, broadened um, uh, our place of service for reimbursement um, for both distant and originating sites, and that includes originating site of home for where our members are located, which served us really well prior uh, to the pandemic, but also in particular during the pandemic with the, the initial stay-at-home orders as well as social distancing. And so um, when we're talking about the you know, post-pandemic policy uh, coverage, uh, it really is based off of what we had already done prior to the pandemic, and we're not going to be changing back. So um, these are permanent policies prior to the pandemic. They had continued during the pandemic, and we're going to continue that post-pandemic. Um, and so uh, for place of service, for example, that place of service home um, will continue to be reimbursed for um, uh, post-pandemic. We also broadened coverage for uh, telemedicine, remote patient monitoring, and asynchronous. All of that uh, expansive coverage uh, starting pre-pandemic will continue um, post-pandemic. We also clarified um, that we did not limit uh, telehealth coverage to only rural settings, and so that will continue uh, post-pandemic as far as us covering within Arizona both rural and urban um, settings with telehealth. Um, and then lastly, um, one thing that did change during the pandemic that I'll, I'll spend a minute to talk about um, in a future slide is that prior to the pandemic, our health plans, and again, Arizona is been primarily, um, our members have been primarily served through managed care, um, is that our, our managed care organizations had the ability to leverage um, telehealth whenever they um, deemed appropriate to have an appropriate network size, but we did not require them pre-pandemic to, um, to utilize telehealth strategies as long as they could demonstrate that they had an adequate provider network. And that, again, subsequently changed during the pandemic that I'll go into. So we can go to the next slide, please. Um, as far as our expansion that will continue uh, post-pandemic, we eliminated any um, restrictions on disciplines that can be reimbursed for telemedicine, so interactive audio-video um, uh, you know, prior to the pandemic, and we're going to continue that. We really defer to a uh, scope of practice as identified and determined by um, the individual practitioner's licensing board. And so um, as a payer, we would uh, defer to uh, scope of practice in regards to when um, interactive audio video is appropriate for implementation versus not. Next slide. And then as far as asynchronous, uh, which is otherwise known as store and forward, we had covered it in very limited circumstances uh, prior to 10 one um, and greatly expanded it to the list of disciplines you see here, and we're going to maintain that uh, post-pandemic. Next slide. And then in regards to telemonitoring, prior to 10-119, we limited coverage of telemonitoring to congestive heart failure, and we um, removed any restrictions based on diagnosis. As long as it was medically necessary, cost-effective, we uh, covered telemonitoring, and that was implemented on 10-119 as well, and we'll continue that post-pandemic. All right, so um, moving us along, I wanted to, um, you know, note some of the changes that we made during the pandemic um, and what we're going to do in regards to um, uh, post-pandemic coverage. So we did implement, based off of both member as well as provider request, a temporary audio-only code set of 94 codes. That was in addition to uh, a relatively small set of codes of 13 codes that we covered uh, via Arizona Medicaid uh, prior to the pandemic. So we had about 13 codes that we covered uh, prior to the pandemic, then we added these 94 codes to that for temporary coverage. Um, and then we also added um, uh, additional codes for interactive audio video as well as store and forward and um, added in health plan requirements for pay parity, um, as well as requirement to cover all um, contracted services via telehealth modalities, including audio only when clinically appropriate. And go on the next slide. 
And, and so just to put this um, into context in regard to what we're seeing from a diagnostic standpoint uh, around utilization of uh, telehealth, um, our number one from a claim count or CRN count per 1,000 enrolled members um, uh, is autism. Um, and the second um, is opioid uh, dependence followed by PTSD. And so similar to um, you know, what my co-presenter ha had mentioned as far as Dr. Dowler, um, you know, we are seeing, you know, both pre-pandemic as well as during the pandemic, um, you know, significant access uh, to care through telehealth modalities for behavioral health conditions as well as um, uh, neurodevelopmental conditions. And so um, this does, um, you know, demonstrate that, uh, you know, we need to continue to provide access to care through all modalities, um, not only in person based on um, individual member preference, um, as Oregon had stated, uh, but also just based off of, um, you know, the, the, um, the individual's um, uh, and the provider's uh, balance in regards to what is appropriate for the, um, you know, in-person care delivery versus audio only versus audio visual. And um, I, I wish there was this perfect answer around when should it be via audio visual versus audio only versus in person. I know many states are trying to figure that balance out. Um, at the end of the day, um, it, it boils down to, you know, um, the clinical appropriateness of care and what we have seen with our provider system, including you know, um, you know, many of um, our FQHCs, et cetera, that it really is a balancing act and it's not a one size fits all um, or a, an approach that you only provide audio only or you only provide audio visual, but it's, um, it's really um, having all modalities available based on individual member need as well as preference. Next slide. All right, and so then this also uh, provides a little bit perspective of Arizona um, telehealth utilization, um, and it's specifically looking at uh, a rolling 12-month data uh, per month, and it's the percentage of our enrolled members with one or more telehealth services, um, and that includes, telehealth includes both the interactive audio video as well as audio only and asynchronous. And so prior to the pandemic, uh, we saw about 10% of our members with one or more tel telehealth services in the rolling uh, 12 months. Um, and that, um, you know, uh, peaked in April of 2021. And again, just the, wanted to note this is rolling 12 months to kind of control for the variance. Um, we are seeing that rolling 12 months come a little bit down from that April 2021 peak. But you can see, um, similar to what uh, my co-presenters mentioned, you can see that we have seen a significant growth in telehealth during the pandemic. Okay, and then we can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, this is a um, telehealth coverage summary from the Arizona perspective. Um, it does list out um, what we utilize for modifiers, including for our temporary telephonic code set. So we specifically used an a, a open modifier that we were able to access, which is UD. Um, and so um, wanted to note that's not specific to audio only, but Arizona adopted it specific to audio only. I also wanted to note that Washington State um, spearhead headed an application to the American Medical Association, which houses the uh, CPT code um, book, and um, we have submitted an application um, uh, to the AMA. Multiple states joined on with Washington to submit an application um, for the AMA to adopt an audio-only modifier, and we anticipate hearing back within the next month or so if that got approved. So, uh, for those that were interested in hearing, you know, what specific modifiers um, are being used for audio-only service delivery. Arizona did adopt a specific modifier, but the good, new, uh, the good news is hopefully nationally there'll be a, a CPT uh, recognized modifier as well so that we can have consistency in use, similar to what we're doing right now with interactive audio video um, using the GT modifier, for example. 
All right, and then the only other thing I wanted to note on this slide is that, as you can see, as far as our permanent telehealth policies, we're planning to continue uh, the expansion in code set uh, for telemedicine asynchronous that we had implemented prior to the pandemic as well as during the pandemic. And really the area as far as coding goes that uh, was under evaluation is that temporary uh, telephonic code set. So I'll go into detail on um, where we've landed with that. So we can go to the next slide. Um, we did have during this last legislative session in Arizona, um, House Bill 2454, um, which um, had multiple components, including for the private commercial uh, insurance industry, as well as the formation of a telehealth advisory committee um, that I co-chair. And um, through this telehealth advisory committee, you can see some of the requirements, but one of the requirements that we had just recently actually gone through is a review of what services by code um, could be delivered via audio only, um, starting 1-1 of uh, 22. And so if we can go to the next slide, um, we'll, this will give you a summary of that. So basically, as I mentioned, the, there was 94 codes on that temporary audio only code set in Arizona. Um, based on review through our uh, telehealth advisory committee, there was a recommendation to um, maintain 24 of those 94 codes, and we had previously um, had uh, reimbursed for 13 codes on our permanent audio-only code set, so we're looking at uh, 37 distinct codes that uh, Arizona Medicaid, as well as the private commercial insurers in Arizona, um, will reimburse for when delivered via audio only. And um, I do get asked as far as the code set, um, folks from other states um, are interested, we will be posting that um, to our website. Um, and it is, um, uh, we have a telehealth specific, telehealth advisory specific web link and it's included in this presentation. Uh, and then if we can go to the next slide, I'm almost wrapping up. Wanted to also note as far as um, some similar themes to um, Lori and Shannon around um, uh, our planning and looking at member access to care, um, the digital divide, um, looking at any um, healthcare disparities, um, including the broadband and other technology access, that that is something that continues to be um, of utmost priority and we are um, looking at additional analysis to determine, you know, where we can help improve um, healthcare access, you know, for um, telehealth and what some of those barriers are. I also wanted to note that we had um, adopted Oregon's um, telehealth supplemental CAPS questions uh, for telehealth, and so looks at member satisfaction with telehealth, um, including any concerns with privacy when they're receiving telehealth, as well as um, you know looking to see if they had any technology issues during receiving telehealth, if they had received a service via telehealth modality, and I anticipate Arizona um, uh, results will be available in the late fall um, of this year. And so uh, look forward to doing some um, analysis, not only here in Arizona, but also some cr cross state analyses since um, uh, we, uh, I know that we have um, partnered with other states to potentially adopt those same telehealth supplemental questions. Um, and then um, as far as the next slide, wanted to also, um, you know, recap that uh, for our code coverage, that we're maintaining the expansion of um, our codes that um, we had um, added for that interactive audio video, as well as asynchronous modalities. And then I just previously summarized around that audio only coverage um, that will be maintained post pandemic. Um, as far as reimbursement rates, um, I, the telehealth bill does require pay parity um, for our commercial 
um, private health insurers here in Arizona um, for all services with the exception of audio only for physical health. And so in order to not uh, create any disparity between the private commercial world and Medicaid, even though the bill does not specifically require Medicaid in Arizona to do pay parity, we are um, uh, following suit so that we, we continue to um, you know, uh, compete from a, um, access to care perspective within the Medicaid realm. And then um, wanted to also note something that comes up frequently, including in webinars around network standards and how you incorporate network standards, um, telehealth into network standards that um, we have, uh, we are allowing our health plans to incorporate telehealth um, uh, availability into uh, our measurement of appointment availability. We have also recently, as of 10-1 of this year, incorporated um, telehealth as, as part of our time and distance requirements. And at the end of this slide deck, um, there's direct links to those policies um, where you can learn more. Um, and then um, just the last couple of things for me to wrap up before I turn it over to May. Um, wanted to note that as part of our um, telehealth advisory committee, we are required to adopt um, telehealth practice guidelines for providers. And uh, similar to what May had mentioned early on, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. There, we know there's a lot of great work uh, getting done there through individual medical associations, as well as the American Telemedicine um, Association and CCHP, for example. And so wherever we can leverage what already exists, we are going to do that. I know some other states um, and, lo and, and health plans have also adopted specific practice guidelines. So we're in the process right now of researching that and we'll be adopting it uh, by June of 2022. And then ongoing quality monitoring and um, my uh, co-presenters um, did a great job of um, addressing both from a health equity standpoint as well as looking at you know higher care, higher level of care utilization for example um, and other uh, potential ways to monitor for quality um, post pandemic but I know this is going to be on the ongoing uh, radar for Medicaid as well as private commercial insurers uh, moving forward as far as how can we best address um, you know, uh, uh, healthcare service delivery and, and how we're doing, um, and if we're moving the needle around healthcare outcomes by improving access to care through telehealth modalities. Uh, and so some of the routine uh, performance measures that we're already looking at through our system as far as our HEDIS measures, um, that will continue um, and it just adds an additional layer of, um, you know, how we're doing in regards to bumping up those rates, including leveraging telehealth modalities. So with that, um, that brings it to the end of my uh, session and I'll turn it back to May. Thank you, Dr. Salek. As always, that was a great presentation. Um, just really quickly, I just wanted to clarify. So did you say that um, you were paying parity for audio only um, as well? Because that was what was required of the commercial payers, right? Yeah, for behavioral health services. Yeah, behavioral for health. behavioral okay. health. We're still we're still evaluating it for physical health, but that's not required. Pay parity is not required for audio only for physical health um, on the on the private health plan side. So we're evaluating that right now on the Medicaid side. Okay, all right. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, we have a question for you from an anonymous attendee. It said, um, "Did you do out of state visits? How did these numbers change with the decrease in COVID cases?" Um, so as far as out of state, um, like pr from a provider perspective, yes, that was even prior to the pandemic that we allowed, um, you know, our out of state providers, as long as they were registered um, with us and licensed in Arizona to provide healthcare services um, through a distance site other than Arizona, as long as they were within the United States. Okay, I'm going to bring everybody back now. So if um, Lori and uh, Dr. Dowler could come back and Lori, I understand you may still be having issues. So um, let me just double check here and make sure your mic is on. There are a couple of questions here that I think apply to all of you or do all, any of you can answer it. Um, let me just go to, yeah, Stephen Messinger 
had a question. He said that NAC policy staff, and for those who are not familiar, that's National Association of Community Health Centers, have been reporting that CMS is still wavering on whether there will be a federal match for audio only after the public health emergency. What have you heard about this in your state? Or have you heard anything about this? Um, this is Lori. So oh, go ahead, Lori. I was just going to say, you know, we haven't tackled it yet. So I, you know, waiting to see what happens. And, and I think we're just in, in wait mode at this point. Um, we have another question from Anonymous. Um, has the uptick in telehealth increased overall visits and costs to your state Medicaid programs or not because those visits replaced in-person visits? I, I can say for sure in North Carolina, we, we did not see it. It was not duplicative. So we did it. We saw it replacing um, in-person visits and not additive. So our, our cost expectations were much lower than we expected them to be. Yeah, and I think, yeah, to Dr. Dowler's point, like overall healthcare delivery, um, you know, the reduction in in-person care, that telehealth didn't supersede that in Arizona either. So overall service delivery was down in comparison to pre-pandemic. I also want to note from a cost saving standpoint um, that, uh, you know, in Arizona, we cover non-emergency medical transportation. So we do see a reduction in the use of non-emergency medical transportation based on, uh, you know, increased access through telehealth. A uh, question from Justice Detcher. Do you also reimburse for remote patient monitoring, cellular or Bluetooth in order to facilitate uh, physiological and or mental and behavioral readings? And I'm happy to comment if it's incorporated into the actual remote patient monitoring code. Um, and usually those codes actually have that description um, that we would reimburse. So it, it all the the um, it would all be based off of what that uh, remote patient monitoring code entails. But we are, for example, in Arizona covering remote patient monitoring. I don't know if that um, is incorporated within the Bluetooth or that technology around transmission. Uh, but if it is, we would be covering kind of that, that global code rate. Yeah, and same in North Carolina. We were not covering it prior to the pandemic. So this is one of our COVID accommodations we made that, that we think is a real positive to keep on. We have a question from Trisha Shell Guy or Guy. Um, are any states using telehealth services delivered in mobile treatment vehicles? And if so, any lessons or concerns? Are any states considering using them in mobile methadone settings? We certainly had um, practices who would have people drive up and they would hand a tablet and they would have a essentially a telehealth visit from the parking lot um, because the patient didn't have access to technology at home. And this was when there wasn't a lot of PPE. So we reimbursed for that, but I don't know anything, you know, nothing else in the mobile space that I'm aware of. So we have a question from Heather Mills regarding documentation standards. And I, I know this may not be required in like all your programs, but she's asking what is the documentation standard for collecting consent for telehealth providers? How do providers document verbal consent, a recording, or via a tech app that collects DocuSign? I, I'm happy just to share my two uh, cents on this. So, you know, ultimately there's, you know, specific statutory requirements around consent for telehealth services. Um, and then uh, typically each of the licensing boards may also have their own requirements um, around um, how to obtain consent for services delivered via telehealth. Um, having said that, uh, you know, there is this uh, reality that the service is via telehealth and we are providing it to individuals that may not have access 
to, um, you know, DocuSign or the internet. And so um, there is an element of reality and flexibility in regards to getting um, consent from the individual receiving the healthcare service verbally, for example. So, um, you know, I think it, it all def uh, d uh, is based off of the provider level comfort in doing so and then documenting that verbal consent. But having, you know, provided healthcare services via telehealth, et cetera, um, just wanted to note the reality of the uh, reality is not of all of our um, members have access to DocuSign or other modalities wh which would enable that type of um, written consent. And we, we went around and around around how prescriptive to be in our clinical policies around consent and, and decided that ultimately it was the liability of the provider um, to make sure that they were getting consent for the services that they were providing. And this really came up in the group visit space around how do you do virtual group visits and um, consent for that and, you know, from a privacy standpoint. But yeah, we left it, uh, we left it, the onus is on the responsibility of the provider. Mm -hmm. And, and to that point, just to add another thing, some of our providers may, uh, based on their comfort level, may want that first visit to be in person to get all of that written informed consent. And we would cover non-emergency medical transportation to that first visit. So they might operationalize it that way by having that first visit to get all of that um, to overcome maybe some of the, the digital concerns around um, you know, internet and access to technology. Um, this question is for all of you, but probably like Lori might have something a little bit more concrete around it. Do your states require physicians to document the reason an audio video service was not performed when an audio only visit was done? Sure, I can speak to that. I don't believe, I, I don't know what the documentation requirements are besides including a patient, you know, including the modifier on the billing code. Uh, there may be some additional, you know, um, documentation requirements beyond that, but I'm not certain. So we have a question from Bill England. While it appears televisits did not increase total visit, is it possible to tease out if care is still being put off due to the pandemic? So once people are fully mobile post PHE, the visits avoided will start to catch up. I think that's a risk across the board. You know, a lot of people have put off mammograms and colonoscopies and other, especially the preventive services. Um, and we saw that in our HEDIS measures when we looked at, um, we've recently gotten our data, but actually we maintain on almost everything or got better despite the pandemic um, with a few exceptions. Uh, and hemoglobin A1C is for our diabetics. So I suspect that's if you have a telehealth visit with your diabetic, you're not getting the lab that you need. So we found a few areas where a lab was required, um, which we lagged a little, we lost a little bit of ground, but overall um, have found that we actually maintained and actually did better in the childhood immunization space. So this is an interesting question. Do you have restrictions regarding establishing new patients via telehealth? This is Lori from Oregon and no, we, we do not. Likewise for Arizona Medicaid. I think we did before the pandemic and it's one of the things we loosened. Um, this is from Jess, again, apologies if I mangle your name, Jasper Chaudhary. For all the panelists, can you share more on how decisions were made about which services to make permanently available through telehealth? I'm happy to just give high level that for Arizona, we greatly expanded prior to the pandemic. So we were already in that direction uh, for codes that we had added during the pandemic, as far as like um, the additional codes for um, interactive audio video, as well as asynchronous, we decided to maintain. Um, and then the audio only coverage codes that went through our telehealth advisory committee. And it was a review both clinically as well as code description in order to make that determination. We had a complex process in North Carolina, mainly because we didn't have anything before. So this was a big a jump. I led a COVID telehealth work group during the pandemic for DHHS, and we involved a lot of stakeholders, physicians from private practice and from health systems and payers and all sorts of people were involved in it to get input and feedback. We also met with our payers council 
um, and for the state several times to talk about kind of what broadly payers were thinking about. And then our team did every single code that we turned on temporarily. We, uh, the executive team reviewed from every layer, from compliance to legal, to billing, to, you know, the cost of it. Um, and we went through a very painstaking process on each of those codes. This question is from Terry Bouton. I think Dr. Dowler mentioned a concern about increased use of audio for alcoholism treatment during the pandemic. Could she elaborate on the nature of the concerns? It's not so much in the, there was a time in the pandemic we expected it, we wanted it. You know, we turned it on for a reason. We wanted people to have access however they needed to have access. But as people, um, as the pandemic got lower and people got vaccinated, our expectation was that the services would happen more in person or by telehealth because that was our preferred modality. But we saw a couple of um, intensive codes. Um, so for like outpatient intensive therapy codes that were getting billed at a telephonic rate much higher than we would expect, especially during the months when our rates were very low in the state. And so we're just looking into that to try to understand, you know, what was going on and is it just a coding issue that people were using the wrong modifier. And our last question is from Anonymous. Have any of you compared pre-pandemic telehealth visits to the current percentage of telehealth visits? How do these numbers look like? But we hardly had anything, so it was easy. <laughs> Yeah, and we we had significant um, we had significant growth in Arizona as well, and I think I probably have shared it in a previous webinar, May, but I'm happy to drop in that slide in regards to kind of our pre-pandemic utilization uh, versus that significant growth curve um, during the pandemic. So we do have that pre-post comparison available in a data slide, if that would be helpful. Yeah, I I think probably most Medicaid pro programs probably saw that happen in that they opened up some of like their policies to allow for more to be used just naturally. And then there was just a concern of people with the pandemic. Um, and then our last question is from Heidi Warrington. Do the telehealth visits have to be recorded or just transcribed? They, um, I can speak from Arizona's standpoint. No, that, um, you know, they do like with asynchronous, it is, you know, recorded and forwarded for the purpose of the actual visit. But as far as like an interactive audio video or audio only, it would just be similar to um, an in-person that you don't record it. Um, the way that you record it is through documentation, through your actual uh, chart note, and that's uh, what you have to justify the billing for that service. Yeah, Heidi, I don't know what state you're located in, but there are also, I will warn you, some states that explicitly prohibit it and tell you do not record or they make it illegal for you to record those sessions. So depending on what your state you're in, it can also be like illegal to do that. So that is it for our questions. I Once again, I just want to thank our panelists, Dr. Dowler, Lori Coiner, and Dr. Salik. You guys were terrific. I knew you would be because you've done this for us before. Um, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you to our attendees. Uh, just really quickly, I'm just going to share my screen one last time. Uh, if you are interested in getting more information from CCHP, you can subscribe to our newsletter and go to our website. Thank you again to our fabulous panelists for their great presentations and for their answers to uh, many questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to them all. I knew that this would happen just because these ladies are incredibly great and they were going to get a bunch of questions. Um, we do ask that you fill out the evaluation form that you will get after this webinar is over. It is really important for us to get that information that lets us know how, what you thought of this and if we should um, continue on with these series and also what future topics you might be interested in. Once again, I wanna thank our speakers, Dr. Sarah Salig, Dr. Shannon Dowler, and also Lori Coiner. Um, thank you also to our attendees for attending these webinars and making them such a success. And also thank you from me to my CCHP staff for helping pull off these webinars. It's been a lot of work. So thank you for all your contributions to them. Hope everybody has a great day and stay safe. Have a wonderful weekend as well.